so previous. <laughs> but uh, I think you've, you've uh, highlighted some of the uh, many tensions which we, which previous speakers have mentioned. Um, we've got about 20 minutes for uh, questions and answers. So if I can get Janet and John and Kristen up to the, what do we call this? Uh, the table. Up to the table. Oh, and there's a hand mic. Um, well, that's still a lot of people. Is it where we get set? I do. Do you all just sort of look? What's this? I'll sit in front of the table. Yeah. Can everyone hear? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we don't need the hand mic, possibly. Um, questions, comments, statements, denials? Firstly, as a, as a name uh, and a term of the Lord and the Lord of Society, I very, very much enjoyed the presentation. I think all the points said, um, certainly said people like myself who are completely gifted amateurs, where you're fired up a little bit more to uh, uh, dwell on the, on the problems. Uh, I'd like to make just one practical suggestion. As church wardens, uh, we receive the Archdeacon's charge every year. Uh, and would it not be possible to ensure that with the charge, the new church wardens <coughs> actually get a copy of that and sign it and return it with the acceptance of the charge? Um, it's very low. It's a very low rent idea, but it might actually get the points that have uh, been made, and particularly the uh, uh, ratio of the uh, judgment. Arches down to uh, the, those of us on the ground who sometimes feel we're a voice in the wilderness. I think that's a lovely idea, and I'm going to raise it with the Archdeacons who have to do it. So thank you very much. Um, Rosary Cranman, I'm the coordinator of the Corpus of Anglo Saxon Stone Sculpture, which has been going for many years, and actually, uh, we have nearly finished the kingdom. And uh, we hope that you'll use it as a database. Although I have had vicars who have said, uh, in publishing our stones, you're giving a, a charter for thieves. And I'd like to take that up, if I may, and make three comments on three crosses that are, have a price on their head at the moment. Unfortunately, all of this arose before 2012, before your excellent notes came up. The first one, is a piece of sculpture that was found at Dowlish Wake in Somerset. And um, I, it was in a garden. This is one divorced from its church. A beautiful figure of a bust of, of St. Peter with Sanctus Petrus, actually written on it as well. When I was writing up that area, I, found, I, went, I went to look at it. and was stupid enough to say it was very important. Um, and the minute that was said it was very important, the people who got it were urged to um, put it on the market. Went to Sotheby's and reached a fantastic price uh, by an anonymous collector, 250,000 pounds. And that then sent a ripple through all churches right up to Yorkshire, where a very well-known cross that appears in every book of Anglo-Saxon art was then going to be offered for sale by the Churches of Croft, the Church of Croft in Yorkshire. And there is, the excuse they gave for that was that they had asked the ecclesiastical um, the insurers how much it would be insured for. And so I was interested to read your note. And they gave some great price. They couldn't insure it for that, therefore they had to sell it. And I don't know if anybody else has had this too. But it is a, it is a real worry, and the word should get around that that's not what we insure for. It, it went through a process of which I tried to be involved but was really rather stopped. And I, I have to say, I suppose, really, that I'm not welcome in a lot of places because it actually said they seem to be coming, I'm going to leave next, I'm leaving next week. <laughs> but um, actually, it got to the stage of going to the Chancellor and he said, no, it couldn't be sold on the open market, but it could go to two local, one of two local museums, York. Now, of them could afford it, it was then taken away by the church warden 
who was a primary, he and the, church, and the archdeacon were the primary agents of sale, and locked his gun cupboard and said, then nobody shall see it. So it is, this is one of the major pieces of Anglo-Saxon sculpture. It still um, belongs to sorry? the church. It still belongs to the church. <coughs> it still belongs to the church. At the moment, it's got six months loan to Bose Museum, and it's still got a price on of £40,000. Now, Downish Wake emerged from the private collection this year, came again to, uh, to auction. It was then sold for £40,000 to, what I don't mind saying, to Max, who have offered it now £120,000. And Taunton Museum is trying to buy it with our help, which I think is a real scandal. The third one, and I think this is something you should all be aware of, is one that was in a church that was sold for alternative use. And we haven't talked about much about the churches for alternative use today. Uh, but in that church for alternative use, long before this, it was first of all sold to a religious community because it was a little church that had been, had been part of a priory. Sold to a religious community, and I suppose the church felt that the cross that was there, this is Peter in Northamptonshire, was safe from them. They then dissolved and you know, withered away, and uh, they sold it to private people. Unfortunately, when we were starting to gather it for the corpus, the geologists went there and so drew it to their attention with the owners. They then sent it to Bonhams. I went up to Bonhams and made a fuss, and in the end it was withdrawn, but they had moved house and taken the cross with them, we don't know where. Well, I'm just, you know, saying this, these pieces of sculpture may be cluttering up. They are clutter, I know, for many people. For many clergy have said to me, we don't want a museum in our church. We're, you know, we're looking for the future, not the past. If they ask us at the corpus or anybody else to help them display these things, and English heritage in the past, I don't suppose it will in the future, but it did, it did give them money to help display, there is the first evidence of Christianity they have, sometimes earlier than and a whole story can be made. I'm sorry for spoken so long, but I've been waiting for a conference like this for so long. And I do think if we can spread the message, it's going to be incredibly valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Rosemary. Nigel. Well, I mean, I, I, uh, I quite agree that these, these bits, I mean, I, we had a stone cross stone from one of my jokes at Tallison oh, yes. before I even saw it. it was went after a big funeral. And um, my, I mean, my only comment really about how do we display these things in a way in which the church doesn't become and look like a museum. And I think that's where we need some real creativity yeah, and, right. and positive engagement. I'll give you one little story of, of where I lost the battle. Um, I had a church board who wanted to display a, a 1634 um, a Lenten Bible, which had been copied out of the place. And, and, it, and you know, it started to set a sort of a degree of enthusiasm for having to build all these display cases, and there, and there were other bits of things that we could put in there. Uh, what I really wanted to be able to do, there had been a, a 1960s um, sort of refit at the, the altar, and an east facing altar had been built in in a rather grim 1960s way. Now, I thought this is my chance to get a, a, a nice nave altar out of a bookcase, yes. out of a book display case. And, and and we could so we would then celebrate on the on on, on a glass topped altar with 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 the Bible in. But oh you know, it had to be movable and it started and then we started to get sort of lose lose enthusiasm. But I, I think there needs to be a sort of an imaginative way of of displaying things so that they don't lose their central purpose of yeah, Sure. Uh, well, I very much agree with that, and I think also going back to the thing about telling the story, it's one thing to display it, it's another thing to sort of explain what it's all about and how things to the church. Um, another thing I pick up from, from you, Dave Rosemary, is the whole business of our relationship with the auction, with yeah. the auction houses, and I think there's some work to be done there, and I sort of feel, I wouldn't mind, having worked at Sundays for 10 years, I wouldn't mind meeting some of that. I, I, I think also an issue that is, is, is lurking behind your question and 
along what we've spoken about today, it's whether or not increasing awareness of parish treasures is a protection for those treasures, or whether it encourages thieves and auctioneers, if you can tell the difference between the two. <laughs> uh, and you know, that, that's something that we seriously have to, um, have to wrestle with. My own view is that awareness is protection, and that knowledge is for the enhancement of all of us, and that we should encourage knowledge and protection. But we have to have a much more constructive relationship with the commercial trade. Otherwise, the inducements to sell become too great for average parishes to resist. Could I just say also, in, in line with what you say, it's a slightly strange perspective on it, because with country houses, obviously, that I'm looking at, I have for the first time started repeatedly to hear a very refreshing opinion about the photography of the country life. Some people are worried about the security implications of it. And now several times, owners have said, well, actually, the most effective way of ensuring that this object is not so stolen is to have it published in a magazine, because everybody knows it's there. My, and that, I feel, you know, again, that's about taking a balance, you know, taking a view about the risks involved, and then sort of stepping out of doors and saying, okay, it's here. I think ultimately we will stand to benefit from that. My one concern is, of course, the ideas of inventories. You know, the, the, it's almost impossible to inventorize everything, isn't it? Um, and, and so you do ultimately come back to what Nigel so beautifully expressed, which is an aesthetic appreciation of the churches and why that makes their contents um, even the ordinary of the special. I think just very, oh. sorry, but if I may, um, we are encouraging every church to produce a statement of significance. And I think that looking at it in totality is really helpful. And if we, that would be the core thing on the um, church heritage record data of national database. Thank you. Uh, I'm Robert Hutchins, so I'm a church archaeologist, and I'm also a DAC uh, advisor. Um, my problem as a DAC advisor is that the hard pressed clergy and the hard pressed church wardens and the hard pressed PCC are more concerned with keeping the roof off and the bats away uh, and trying to make the church live than worry about its contents. In fact, it's a burden to them. And that burden is not lifted by the fact they don't know the significance of what they have in their parish churches. And the church's reaction to a conservation issue or a historical or archaeological issue varies from one incumbent I came across who begged me to take his brass away because the conservation cost was too high, to another who was delighted to finally get a Roman mausoleum in his churchyard and could I take it out now? <laughs> um, what worries me about inventories which are driven from the bottom up is there is no corporate memory within parishes. Uh, the clergy do have other things. They don't get any kind of training about the historical importance of their structure or their contents. The elderly members of the parish council are now going to PCCs in the sky. So there's no corporate memory of what is there, particularly when you have fitted carpets. I have one church warden who didn't know he had brasses because uh, the fitted carpets were covered for the last 20 years. Churches do have to be places of worship. They are places where God is worshipped as they have been for a thousand years. But what I'm looking for perhaps is information, hard information on which good decisions about reordering can be taken, sound decisions can be taken. But that information may not necessarily reside in the parish. We might not believe or understand the significance of their fixtures and fittings. Well, I, I just respond to you by saying the Church Heritage and um, Records National Database, which will be up and running within the next 12 to 24 months, can only be improved on, focused on the statement of significance, is where I think we need to start to address. And I think you yeah. used a, a lovely phrase there in terms of corporate memory. And I mean, it's that goes what John was saying about making things known. It's certainly the case that when when the churches, uh, parish church, starts to become um, to break down the barriers between 
it's the worshipping congregation and those who have another interest in it. And to be able to say, well, actually, we really need your enthusiasm for the historical content of this church. We need your expertise. And we are prepared to share that with you. Somehow or other, we've got to find a way of sharing the burden of the cost yes. of, of maintaining it as well, which you know automatically just keeps coming back to the congregations. But I think when that sort of building up of the corporate memory can happen, then that, you know I think you can tap into a rich vein of enthusiasm for using that to tell the story. Do you you yeah. had make an observation, which is that uh, we've got a very distinguished uh, panel here. Uh, this is terribly important. The size of the uh, audience is not um, indicative of the interest people have in this subject. By the way, I'm Julian Argar, also DAC. But it was so difficult to know about today. Uh, I happened to buy Country Life a couple of months ago, and to see uh, mention of this. But the other, only other way I knew about it was two days ago when I got your monthly newsletter. And two days ago, to make, you know, uh, it was there. But where has this been publicised? I think if more people had known about it, um, there would have been a very much bigger audience for colours of wisdom. In my way, uh, my communications uh, officer here. Um, part of the uh, lack of awareness is that we put this together quickly to address a very timely concern. So uh, we did a first question country life, um, thanks to John Goodall. So which I think will agree with a very wide range of things. Several uh, e newsletters and several uh, websites concerned with churches such as the CCT um, or Heritage, like the Museum Association. So we did try to get the word out, but it was a very good term. Thank you. Sir. And, and, the, and the audience makes up in quality. <laughs> what it is lacking in numbers. Uh, I have one question. We, we are very fortunate to have a very rare specimen in the audience. They are a living, breathing chancellor. <laughs> and, and, and what I would like to ask, because I'm, I'm terribly confused by the conflict between the uh, very welcome ruling of the court of March and the presumption against set out, and the proceeding very unwelcome history of court and diocese of London, we seem to be, indicate great lack of awareness of the uh, church process. What is, is this, is the view of the court of arches binding upon diocese and church space? Well, since we are a small um, group here, I can be indiscreet. You're being repeated. The answer to your question is that the rulings of the Court of Arches are, is binding on the diocesan chancellors. And the diocesan chancellors are the ones who take the decision as to whether a faculty will or will not be granted in any particular case. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring in what I was going to say at the same time as answering your question. Um, I do sit as a diocesan chancellor, and also I practice as a barrister in this sort of field. And I was engaged professionally in the case of the Laycock Chalice, which is the thing that the British Museum is trumpeting its success as having bought for a million and a half pounds from the, uh, from the church wardens of Lake. It's a fabulous bit of silver, 15th century silver, which has been used as a chalice, chalice since the 17th century, and you would might have thought that there is no decent reason why it should have been sold. I was engaged for the one man in the parish who stood out against such a sale, saying no, the thing should remain in the parish. And the matter went to a consistory court. And I remember at the time advising my cut that, in my view, we would lose in front of the diocesan chancellor 
because the diocesan chancellor has a tendency to back up what the PCC wants. But I said that if we appealed it to the Court of Arches, we would win that, because the Court of Arches is presided over by a very enlightened man called Charles George, who taught me history once, and is generally a good thing. <laughs> what I'm hinting from that, and take answering Lloyd's question, is that the diocesan chancellors are a varied lot, and unfortunately <coughs> some of them are more keen on um, mission than heritage, and therefore are too easily swayed by arguments in favour of a sad. I need too long, but the point I wanted to make is this. When I was opposing the Laycock Chalice sale in the consistory, um, I had against me the, 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 the vicar and church wardens and everybody who was keen on acquiring the million pounds from the British Museum, and naturally the British Museum were in favour of acquiring it. So I was alone. Nobody else could object. And I said, I was going to unfairly ask Janet, but I won't. Where were you <laughs> when we, I was trying to oppose um, uh, that sale? But I, I can draw the question, but I make a serious point, which is this. The Chancellor has to decide in these cases between, as it were, the conservationists on the one hand and the, um, the people who want to sell it on the other. And it is very difficult for him to support a conservationist or the opponent of the sale if there are none of them who've put their heads over the parapet and say, we object. Um, and I've known this in my capacity as a chancellor when an appalling scheme for ruining a church has come forward. And the church establishment, as it were, is in favour of it, but there's nobody opposing it. Because it's difficult for me as the Chancellor to say, I reject everything you say, if not the word, there's not a word of friendly. So what I say to everybody here is, if there is a bad proposal coming forward, please put forward your voices as objectors, even if informally, write a letter to the registrar, so, you, so that the Chancellor has got something to go on if he wishes to 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 uh, uh, disapprove his scheme. Well, that's a very good bit of practical advice. That's the witching hour now. I want to thank um, John, Nigel, uh, Kristen, and Janice. I want to thank you all for uh, devoting a Friday morning before a bank holiday to come and listen to us and discuss this very important issue. And uh, I hope we will pursue these uh, these questions further. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Can I just say that the today's proceedings uh, ready to be recorded and the video is available on our website, the site Andrew's website, for you to have a please tell everybody in your parishes and diocese about it.